Hi, everyone. Welcome to another instance of the Molecular ML Leading Group. Um, today, we're, we're really thrilled to have Yushuan Song present equivariant flow matching for 3D molecular generation with hybrid probability path transport. So Yushuan is a PhD student at the Institute for Artificial Industry Research at Tsinghua University. Um, and uh, so, yeah, he's going to present today, and we're really thrilled to, to have him here. So take it away. Okay, uh, thanks a lot for the invitation. And today I will uh, introduce our recent work with uh, equivalent formatting, and we focus this on the task of 3D molecular generation. So if there's any questions, you could just uh, interrupt you uh, whenever you want, okay? So, hey, okay. So here is the overview of today's talk. We will first introduce the necessary backgrounds like for example the task of the data we study with or the method basically machine learning methods of the flow matching and also then we go deep into our method the equivalent flow matching as known as EQFM and at last we will have some discussions and also introduce some several future directions so Let's start with the definition of geometric graph generation. So here we introduce the general formulation of a geometric graph. Like a geometric graph is described as a graph where each node is embedded in a d-dimensional Euclidean spaces. And there are generally three elements to describe a geometric graphs like First, we have adjacency matrix, which stands for the topology informations. And then we have some like scalar features, usually some vectors to describe the properties of maybe the whole molecular, sorry, maybe the whole geometric graphs or maybe the property of some elements of that graphs. And we also have a coordinate matrix, which is like to describe the conformation of the geometric graphs in the Euclidean spaces. Also, like you could use like uh, different ways to express the conformation. I think it's also feasible, like the torsion angles. But now we fo uh, we, we focus on this formulation. And like we use the geometric graphs, we could represent it uh, several important properties like topology, chemical properties, and conformation of 3D molecules. So the task of geometric graph generation has a lot of applications. First, we could see that the protein design as the generation of large geometric graphs and the structure-based drug design could be seen as a conditional generation task, like we need to condition on the pockets. Also, there are some like uh, catalysis systems could be seen like we, we need uh, not only like generate uh, geometric graphs, we need some also generate some extra variables like lattice metrics to describe the uh, the other properties. And also the RNA and D DNA design is also in the scope of geometric graphs generation. So like study the generative modeling of this kind of data has a lot of challenges and we will highlight several in the following. So firstly, I think it's a uh, quite uh, special to this kind of data and I refer to it as the structure constraint. So like the diffusion models is like a uh, very famous and powerful models uh, which show great promise, especially in the generation of like images or videos. The why the diffusion models is compatible with like image data, there has a lot of series or explanations. And I uh here's the opinion of mine, like the information in image data could be better decomposed by adding multiple level noises. So this looks like a more natural modeling uh, order, like close to fine from a uh, like no, uh, abstract and to some fine grained features. And this is uh, like another uh, modern order could be seen like if we start from the uh, top pixel, the top left pixel to the down right pixel, like what, what this done in the pixel scene and 
and this could be not uh, compatible with the image data. So in this way, we could decompose the data and result in some smooth learning targets and which could be benefit our generation or training. But for molecular, uh, the things is quite different. And I will uh, introduce that the challenges from two perspectives. First, we could see like we like changes the coordinates variable of a autumn in the molecular is not equivalent to add noise to a pixel in the images. So basically it is equivalent to move the position of the pixel in the images. So this is to see like if we add like a large amount of noises to the pixel or uh, to the images, uh, like the uh the third figure uh, the third figure of this generation that uh, this diffusion process, we could still like observe there is a dog in the image. But if we add a small amount of the noises to the coordinates, it's not only changes the values of the coordinates itself, it also changes the relationship of that autumn to all the autumns, which the relationship is, is also uh, represented by the distance to this uh, between the autumns. So we could find that if we add like relatively small amount of noises to the coordinates, the structure of the molecular is kind of destroyed. We can now recognize which, which, what is the original molecules. So another perspective is that like the structure information is very sensitive to the perturbation. And in the middle is the figure of the bond length and energy of the hydrogen hydrogen bond. So we could find that if the distance between these two atoms is away from a very sharp regions, the, there is no bond could be uh, formulated. So this shows how the structure data, the geometric graphs, especially the coordinates variable, is sensitive to the noises. And we do not have a feasible way such as images to decompose the information of that kind of data. So this also implies, uh, we also show to generation processes of the uh, diffusion models. The left one is equivalent diffusion models and the right one is some latent diffusion models called the GOLDM. So we could, uh, we could find that from the most steps during the generation, the autumns just randomly changes their positions in the uh, spaces. And in the last several steps, suddenly we, they fall to a real molecular. And I think the generation process, process of of this is not stable and appealing enough. So two other challenges is the multimodality. Like the multimodality is that the geometry graphs usually can say so of uh, multimodality variables. For example, to describe the coordinates variable, we could use some continuous representations like continuous variables to describe the coordinates. And for the features of the like Autumns, for example, the autumn types, we could use, we could generally use different kind of data types like discrete autumn types or discretized charges to represent the uh, whole information of the geometric graphs. And another challenge is the geometric symmetry. This is to see like the density function implied by the generative model, like should be a uh, roto translational. Actually, the IC sun. Uh, environment to the to the like coordinate system changes. This is to see the density function, which represents the our evaluation by the by our uh, probability model should not changes by any kind of coordinate system change. So this is the challenges of the generative modeling of geometric graphs, and then we go to the basics of flow matching. So uh, I guess most, most of you are quite familiar with the flow matching. So I will go over this part uh, quickly. If you have any questions, just, uh, just inter interrupt me. Okay. So we start with the normalizing flow. The normalizing flow is a very famous generation model, which consists of multiple transformation layers and each transformation could make some 
prior uh, distribution to be more complex and uh, in the end, uh, like if if the layers of the uh, transformations is large enough, and the uh, normal energy flow could represent a uh, very uh, complex distributions. So the continuous normal energy flow is like we there is not finite layers of transformations. We consider like uh, we are assuming uh, infinite layers of normal energy flow. This is to see we can. Uh, change the transformation uh, represented by the neural networks as a, a continuous in-time transformation. And generally, training a continuous normal end flow, like uh, also uh, we could we need to simulate the whole the whole transformation. Like we, we need to project the data sample into the prior and use the whole trajectory to calculate the likelihood and conduct maximum likelihood training. Well, flow matching is something quite uh, very appealing because it's simulation fluid. We do now need to simulate the whole trajectory to like train a continuous normal learning flow. It instead study a more general objective, like consider we could, for any kinds of distributions, there is some transformation between a prior, which is usually a simple distribution like uh, uh, like Gaussian distributions, like we have a lot of, we have many kinds of transformations from the prior to uh, complex distributions. And we consider the transformations represented by the vector field. And the flow matching, like the, uh, uh, the goal of flow matching is like to match the marginal vector field like by a parameterized neural network. So this is general intractable. So the good part is that uh, we could use a uh, continuous probability pass to like match the continue continue to optimize the continue uh, so sorry the conditional flow matching objectives, and to get the same kinds of, of, of optimization that we may want. So this is to see like we could just like do interpretation between the each data point. Between and the prayer, and we match the conditional vector field of this trajectory, and to get the model we want. So, one widely applied objectives of flow matching is so called OT pass flow matching. This is like we could like consider we have a prayer, we have a data distributions, we just do linear interpretations, and for each data point, sorry, not each data point, each samples in the sample space, which is on the linear interpretations, we just optimize is like towards the targets. This is to see like, consider a pair of data like X1 and X0. And for all the data points in the lines X1 to X0, we optimize the vector field of that sample make it towards the, uh, make this equivalent to the uh, vector x1 minus x0. So this is like a very uh, intuitive objective. And so this is the linear interpretations to train the flow matching, but we could find there's some like cross lines, but it should be noted that the, flow, the vector field learned by flow, flow matching is never crossed. This is to see that we cannot uh, learn the learned flow matching cannot cross during the generation. So they will twist it instead of cross. So this is a learned vector field. Okay, so uh, any questions? Okay, then we go to uh, our mo our method equivalent flow matching. So the key intuition behind the equivalent flow matching is that we find that the training of like the equivalent diffusion models is essentially an SD processes. It has some especially unstable dynamics on the like uh, molecular spaces. And this could be like not appealing considering the structure constraint. 
So the flow matching provides an alternative way which could learn the vector field and generate the coordinates by like generate the molecules by solving an ODE. And it also has a simple objective and more stable generation procedures. So the first part, the methodology part, we will discuss two key components of our method. The first is like the equivalent optimal transport. And the second is the hybrid probability path. So uh, this is the left is a generation procedure of diffusion models, and the right is a generation procedure which is trained by directly applied the OT flow matching objective. It's just a similar like the like this, I think it's like that's this synthetic 2D synthetic uh cases, like the generation procedures, like the each point may be twisted cut as the linear interpretations of the during the training could be crossed. So in the molecular generation cases, we could see that that most of the atoms first collapse to the center and they 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 expand to the partitions. They uh they go into their targets. So the first is also show some properties of twisted generation. But one appealing generation procedure should be like the synthetic case shown in this slides. Like from the prior to the targets, like could we just go some strict trajectories instead of twisted or crossed? So the intuition behind the equivalent optimal transport is that could we minimize the transport dis distance from the prior, like from the noisy samples to the target we generated during the generation process. So this is like we introduce a concept called equivalent optimal transport. This is considered a training procedure like we sample a point cloud from some noisy, some prior distributions. And we have a point cloud which is from the empirical data distributions. And we just directly interpret it do some interpretation between these two point clause, like the two point point size. And obviously there could be some cross of that linear interpretations. But the equivalent optimal transport is aimed to find the best alignment considering all the rotations as like the translation is, uh, the translation factor is removed by citing the whole system in the zero of my space. So this is to say like, we first have a sample from the prior distributions and we have a sample from uh, empirical distributions. And we first do the following procedure like we we find the optimal mapping, consider all the rotations and alignments. It's like an iterative process procedure like the uh, interactive close point algorithms. We first uh, align, do some alignment between the between the two uh, point sides, and then we optimize the rotation to minimize the distance. And after the new after the rotations, we also conduct uh, alignment to minimize the distance. Like we may iterate for several interactions. And we approximate find a uh, new positions of the uh, data dis of the data, and we find a new alignment between the points. So this is the whole procedure formulated by an equation. But uh, intuitively, we could find we could uh, view this process as use a structure prior to generate the data for the flow matching. So. There is a, another thing that we I need to mention that there is a concurrent work also at New Repres, uh, 2023 named equivalent flow matching. And we also acknowledge each other in our papers as concurrent work. So they use the nearly the same uh, theorem or the same algorithms to study the particle dynamics. 
Can I ask so, you a quick question here before you move on? The this R, this is a this is one R for everything, right? It's not specific for each data point. Oh, uh, sorry. There's it's a global this R, this transformation is over the whole set of of like the blue points in this case, or the the um it's not like a, a one transformation for each each data point. Is that right? Uh, right. Uh, actually, it's a uh, one transformation for each pair. Like if if the same data points with different noise, we we need to recalculate the transformation. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. For each time you do an update, but rather than yeah, okay. Uh, um, you have a sample from your uh from your data, and then you have the um the one that you're trying to optimize to and you're trying to match these guys up but there's that one transformation is for the pair of the of these two data points right exactly and, and this r is it's a rotation and translation is it also a scale or is it just a translation r is stand for the uh, rotation transformation just for the rotation um right okay. And then for the, is there a, a centering process or a scaling process too? Or is it uh All right. get, there's uh, a, there, uh, sorry? Yeah, so uh, <laughs> sorry, where is that in this equation here? Uh, for the uh, uh I mean for the translation, there's like we're always centering the uh we're always centering the no matter the noises, the noise sample or the a data point, we also centerize in the zero of my space. Like the sum of the coordinates is zeros. Um, and doing this, um, solving for this uh, transform is um, can be done analytically or in a, a, it's very computationally efficient. It's like a, um, a, it's like kind of like the RMSD calculations, right? It can be done in almost linear time. Is that right, or is it is it sort of a comp like what is the complexity of the of finding this matching? Uh, I think it's like the oh actually we we have do some kind of both uh empirical study and uh complexity analysis. I think the results could be that in not not in square like in how to say that third like the n third n cubed yeah yeah right. So, so you want to keep the mini batches small enough that this number is not not on your reasonably big. Right. For the like for if the molecular like we, we find like the optimization is like the uh interactive like interactive algorithms, the iteration is not uh is not very large. I think like one hundred is enough, and this could be due parallelly for different pairs in a batch. So I think it's the, it's that not influence the the batch size that not influence the uh extra complexity of this procedure. Awesome. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Uh so this is the final objective. Like we could see like the we first sample prior from the data distribution and the prior distributions. And to map, we then calculate the equivalent optimal transform mapping between the these two sample, and then we get uh, interpretations and train following the typical flow matching algorithm. Okay, so this part is the first like equivalent optimal transport, and then we go into the hybrid probability pass. So. The key multi observations of the multi modality issues in the molecular generation is like, what is the probability path that we should cite for the autumn types? Could we use the same kind of OT path, like just like the we use for the coordinates? But for instance, if we do, if we conduct linear interpretations, we could consider the changes of the max category, like. Here, the max category is like uh, the third category, and the uh, ground truth, the data is like the first category. And we could find that during the linear interpretation between the 
like one hot formulation of the autumn types, the max category could only change once on the interpolation pass, like on the linear interpolation pass. And the change point may be like just at the middle time step, like uh, 0 0.5. So this implies a generation inductive bias, like your model, like your train generation model could determine the autumn types in the middle time steps when the structure is not good enough. And as the probability pass we said during training, it does not have the tendency to modify the category variable as it's only changed once. So could we, the one natural question to ask is that could we have better design passes for the, like for the autumn types? So our solution is to use a hybrid probability pass. This is to say that we set a uh, different path for the coordinates variable and for the categorical variable. Uh, the design of our probability path follows the intuition that we tend to make the information emergence of different modality, like the coordinates or the autumn types in the same speed. So we first approximate uh, mutual information changes by training a classifier which is trained to predict the ground truth autumn types based on the noisy structures during the probability pass. And we calculate the entropy as an approximation. So this is good to find like the uh, entropy actually increase very, uh, very quickly during the first several steps, like before the 0 0.2, we find that the classifier tends to predict like uh, uniformly. This is showing that the structure information related to the autumn types has like decreased very quickly. So we just do several, uh, do a lot of uh, traces like experiments to select the best uh, probability path for the categorical variable. And we find that the, the empirical performance the probability pass with the uh, superior empirical performance shows an aligned tendency based uh, mutual information we approximated. So here is also some observations. We find that uh, a good algorithm should like determine the autumn types when the structures is like satisfying enough, like maybe in the last several steps to determine the autumn types. So. And then we discuss the theoretical property of the equivalent flow matching. Right, so like we could prove that uh, our model has, sorry, rotor translational invariant density modeling. This is like the density we assign to the to each samples does not uh, influence by the rotation transformation or translation transformation. So to prove this property, the key steps is to find that the Jacobi matrix implied by our model is being equivalent. So then we introduce the empirical results of EQFM. So we conduct uh, unconditional experiments, conditional experiments, and we find that the EQRM FM could show a superior performance on several benchmarks. And we also visualize the generation of EQFM. So the left is different model, middle is flow matching, and the right is like trained with equivalent, equivalent optimal transport. We find there is no twisted procedure in the generation procedure of EQFM. Okay, so we also do some ablation studies on the different probability probability pass choosing for the categorical variable, and we find that like the performance is highly influenced by the traces of the probability pass of the categorical variable. Also, like the generation procedure of EPFM is essentially solving an ODE, so we can benefit from the adaptive ODE solver like Dupree 5. 
So with Duplify, we could obtain a near five times speed up compared to the reverse diffusion models. Also, we conduct the conditional experiments, which also saw a consistency results. So here is a summary of the whole framework of equivariant flow matching. Like, so we, we have a, for the coordinates variable, we regularize the generation process with an equivalent optimal transport procedures. And for the joint generation of different variables, we design a hybrid probability path. And the sampling could benefit from the adaptive OD servers. So uh, then we have some discussions on the limitations of the future directions of this work. So firstly, uh, as we also use like the goals in prayer, like we, we deal with the categorical variable the same as the continuous variable, this could be suboptimal. So one feasible solution is that we could use some like discrete diffusion models to deal with the categorical variable. And another direction is to apply the equivalent from matching to structure-based drug design. And we need to, in this case, we need to consider the conditional generation ability of the framework. And another thing is that as one appealing property of flow matching is that flow matching does not require the prayer to be Gaussian. It could be conduct the generation procedures from and arbitrary prior distributions. So this provide more flexibility for the design of the prior of EQFM. Also, actually the, we, we just open source the sampling codes the today at the, uh, this link. And I think the reform mode training code will be soon, like maybe in a week or two. So like, I think there's still some times and <laughs> There are some also related works, like we recently proposed several generative models for the 3D moleculars, and also with these applications in the structure-based drug design. So if you are interested, and I think I still have some times and we could like to show like hey, how to use the code we open source to sampling a molecular. Is, is that okay? It, it would be great to do a demo, but maybe before you do, let's see if there's any questions on the um, on the stuff that you've presented so far. Okay, so any questions? Maybe as people are thinking, one quick question. When you're doing the inference um, and you do the ODE, uh, samplers, can you tell a little bit more about sort of the influence on like the number of of um, sample steps you need to do to get high quality predictions? I noticed you were using the um, like the the sort of advanced ODE samplers. Um, was that um, that's not part of training? That's just part of the inference step. Is that right? Right. And um, did you try other ones, or is that um, I I assume other people are doing this too, but I'm. I guess I wasn't as aware that this is sort of the how people typically use these flow matching algorithms in practice. Is that sort of the state of the art is, is to train it in this appro approach and then use the sort of high quality samplers to, to make inference really quickly? Right, so uh, basically I think that uh, the, the key advantages of the flow matching compared to diffusion models is that if you sampling in solving, uh, by solving an ODE, you could use some adaptive samplers. But I currently find that the adaptive samplers could maybe like more focuses on the efficiencies, but we also, also notice some quality improvements, like the dual profile compared to the earlier solvers, like, right? So the adaptive samplers are actually getting better quality, is that right? Right, also better quality and better uh, speed up. Wow, that's cool. Any other questions before we go into the demo?
I guess uh, maybe a, this is more of a foundational question rather than specifically what you're doing, but in your um, equivariant, um, can you tell a little bit about the, I know there's this difference between um, um, when you have equivariance uh, versus just invariance and how that uh, those concepts relate to making your um, that rotate that uh, transformation um, uh, like uh, um, w is there a, a a way in which you could think of the like an invariant transformation versus the equivariant um, that uh, the way that these transformations are are derived. Um, it, maybe that's not a well-formed question, but I guess I, I've seen these different concepts in different ways and I'm unsure in how they relate specifically to what you were doing. Oh, right. So, so basically, uh, so consider the, we, we just focus this on the discussions of the environment density functions, which is like, uh, especially we discussed when we build the general models on the symmetric data. So like no matter, I think the environment is the is usually like the goal of the system. We want the density of the procedures like finally results into an environment density. But to this end, we need to some components, for example, like the score, score function in the diffusion model or the vector field in the flow matching to be equivalent. And plus an environment prior, we will result a uh, environment density function, I think. So, so that puts a constraint on the on the prior that you need to have is it needs to be um, invariant to translation and rotation. Is that right? Right. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Okay. I can ask one question. Yes, definitely. Yeah, thank you for a great talk. It's, so it seems like this, the equivalent flow matching models, is much more accurate and faster than normal diffusion models. And uh, I'm just wondering if, like, how can I say? Mm. But it seems that normal diffuse model, models models can sample the more more diverse structures. Now, because atom is freely, but atom can freely moving, not compared to the flow matching models. So I'm just wondering if have you ever tried to compare the diversity of structures made by flow matching models, uh, equivalent flow matching models and uh, diffusion models. Okay, so the diversity of the equivalent formation and diffusion models? E yes. All right, so um, this is a question. So basically um, in the Evaluation of molecular generations, especially the current widely applied metrics, we have some metrics like uh, uniqueness or the novelty, and we also report it in the papers. I think, right? So the uniqueness, uh, this is like the valid and unique, uh, like kind of uniqueness, right? So, but but I think. Uh, Basically, I think this matrix could not really like reflect the diversity of the generated samples. Like I think maybe some metrics such as like uh, inception, sorry, FID in images, there is something called uh, FCD maybe, uh, C for chemi uh, chemical. Um, I think the metrics like that could be better to reflect the diversity of the general samples, but there is no such metrics for the 3D molecules, right? So there are some metrics, like as I mentioned, like FCD for the 2D molecules. So 
maybe we could calculate and add this metrics to the evaluation. But basically, I think from the current evaluations, the EQFM also have some good like uh, diversities, right? Okay, I see. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it seems like your model is much more like accurate than diffusion models. So that's more that that would be more practical. And so I'm just wondering if diffusion models uh, gives a lot of garbage, but uh, sometimes very unexpectedly good structure so, or something. So mm -hmm. sorry. Yes, thank right. you so much. Yeah. Uh, right. So, but um, one thing I I want to mention about the diffusion model is that like we we find that as we visualize the generation process, the diffusion model is seems to be very unstable. But I think in some cases, like in um in some level, it benefits from the noises training, like. The augmentations of that noise maybe benefits for the training of the neural networks. So this is like a trade-off between the uh, training and generation, right? Yeah, I see. Yeah, thank you so much. Welcome. Um, can you tell a little bit about the um the the costs associated with training, like um for the data sets that you did train against? Um, you know, what was the compute and how long did it take you to run them and things like that? Uh, the efficiency to calculate the equivalent to optimal transform? To, to, to train the model, what was the compute requirements? Uh, right, I think the the EQFM is trained for three days. Our uh, uh, 1390, uh, like for three days, our a uh, single card, right? So, um, but actually, like the I think the performance of all the models could be increased if we we just extend the training training time, like for maybe uh two weeks, maybe we we could get a better model. It didn't seem like it had fully converged. Right. I. I, I I think the the convergence is quite stable, so we stop chaining. But I think it could be also like uh, increase during if we have a sufficient time. Excellent. Okay, yeah. If we if we have a little bit of time, did you want to do a quick demo um, on the? Okay. The code. Okay, so mm, let's. I will first stop this serving. Okay, can you see this? Yes. This IP I want to be okay. So like the uh the enter point of this sampling procedures, we, we just make the like you know that the code, the whole code structure is very like heavy. But we just make a, a small like sampling interpoint by this uh, by this like by this model uh, by this uh, by this file. So we also equip a Docker file like it contains all the like packages we may need to run or train our algorithms. So the Docker config is uh, our uh, is customized. So the only thing we need to do is into this directory and do a make, and you, we will have a Docker images. And then if we have the images, we just like simply run the run this code. Like for example, like we just run this. We also have the like the checkpoints. So the first they will start to sample. You could do anything you want, like visualize, maybe just add a small function or calculate any kind of metrics. So the sampling speed is quite, I think it's, it's good enough. Like this is the procedure that we sample 100 samples and calculate the stabilities. So let's wait.
Okay, so this is the stability of this 100 samples. So <laughs> I will try. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to open an issue in the GitHub. Okay. Amazing. Okay, that's really fun. Thank you so much for, for presenting. It's um, really um, great to be able to build the these sort of foundational concepts of equivariance and and uh, understanding the limitations and opportunities of the different architectures. It's really fun to learn. Thanks a lot for the invitations. Okay, it was great to see everybody and um, see you soon. Okay, see you.